Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Sales. I'm Ashley Early. I am flying solo again as Casey recovers, and Brian does as well. We wish them the best. But I am so excited because today I am joined by Janice B. Gordon out of, the, out of lovely London in the United Kingdom. Janice is hired by mid-cap companies as a customer growth expert to unleash hidden potential and accelerate growth by investing in customer-centric selling. Her Scale Your Sales framework develops leading edge capabilities to secure, retain, and grow key customer relationships for long-term value and partnership. She's a consultant, speaker, trainer, listed as number 25 in the top 100 global business influencers, number four top sales guru in January 2020, and the author of Business Evolution, Creating Growth in a Rapidly Changing World. Good Lord, is that the book for 2020? So Janice, and I love it. Bring it, holding up the book for that product placement. That's how you know you're in sales when you're always plugging your own stuff. <laughs> but Janice, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So, I mean, just kind of in our pre-talk, we were, we were chatting a little bit about how you are based in London. And I think one of the things I know most of our viewers, most of our listeners, viewers, whatever you call podcast subscribers are, um, are based here in the U S but something I think is really important to understand in the context of the world right now is COVID is a worldwide thing. And a lot of Americans, I think don't quite realize black lives matter is also a bit more of a global movement than we may realize. It's really easy to focus on what's going on in your city, your neighborhood, your state, your country. But Janice, I mean, just tell us kind of what's, what's going on across the pond. <laughs> well, what's well, going on and how are you guys thinking about what's going on over here? Um, you know what I was, I, this is, brought to the surface a, a, a lot of things that have been really buried very deep. I mean, really deep. And um, yeah, we've had a, a tradition of raising up, you know, remember the, you may have heard of the riots. And uh, then there's a consultation, there's a report and nothing really changes. And I think globally, there is a sense that something will happen. And I think that what's, this, what's similar between the US, I have half my family's in the US and I used to work in the US, so I kind of know, know the cultures, uh, the differences um, quite well. Um, but the, I think the difference is, is that it's always gone on. We as black people, this has always happened. The difference is, is that it's recorded. <laughs> so it's undisputable evidence. And you know, I don't want listeners to think that this is an American thing. It's initiated in, in um, America with George Floyd, but it's not, the experience isn't just an, an American experience. And, you know, when I was thinking about us um, talking today, and I, I just wanted to kind of flag up some things. So I've, I've got one or two notes just to make the listeners realize that we have a problem um, too. And, you know, looking at the, uh, uh, what we call is profiling, the uh, British police profile, what they think is uh, highly suspicious or, or people that are likely to commit crimes. And this profiling is highly biased. And so you'll often have black men in particular that are um, picked up under the suspicion of committing a crime, not actually committing a crime. And this is all quite legal, but they're highly targeted. And that people have been very disgruntled about this policing policy that used to be called um, um, stop and search, and it's still referred to um, as that. And so I often have white people say to me, well, you know, more black people commit crimes. So they, you know, this mm. is the justification of it. This is why the police are justified to do that. But I would like people to think about where does that come from? Where does this bias and this, this data comes from? And if we look at the um, uh, more people are commit crime that come from poorer er areas for obvious reasons, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's really quite difficult to survive. And so 
ethnic minorities, a higher proportion of ethnic minorities live in those areas. So is it that you're a black person or is it that you're poor? And this is a global phenomena as Absolutely. well, that you target the wrong thing because you're not willing to invest in access to health, access to education, better housing, all of these things. So you're actually targeting the wrong thing. So this is why the problem never really goes away. And then also um, looking at the amount of deaths in police custody. Mm -hmm. um, there is more than double the amount of black deaths in police custody in, in the UK than if you're um, white, you know. So there is evidence that through excessive force, that more black people die in, in custody. So that's where the kind of similarities um, are. But also because we do do quite a bit of research in, into this area, then, you know, the recent 2017, um, David Lamin, who's an, an, a black MP in parliament, looked at from the last 20 years, the Stephen uh, Lawrence, Lawrence um, there was the McPherson review after the riots. And uh, this said that there's institutional racism within the police force. Well, we haven't really seen that change very much in 20, 20 years, that black people are still 14% um, of the population that is represented in prison and 50% of the um, BAME group represented in, um, in young offenders. But really this goes back to the bias that's in the collecting of the data. If you look for crime within a certain sector and ignore the crime in others, you're going to find it. So, it, you know, if you, you're going to find what you look for. And so I just really wanted to stress as an opener that actually the problem is global. Well, it's certainly what you're seeing in the US. It's um, it's not to the same extent and to the same degrees. There are the cultures different, but it it's going to show as different. It's going to manifest different ways. Of course. And it's, it's really interesting because I mean, just hearing you rattle off those, one of the things that's one of the stats that reflects one of the problems we've got here in the U S regardless of what you feel about the death penalty. One of the issues with the death penalty is it disproportionately affects black, black Americans. It's something like, I think it's, 43% of total executions since 1976 and 55% of people currently awaiting execution, this is according to the ACLU website, are black, even though they're only 20, 30% of the population. That's ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. And, and, it's, and it's, it starts at every step. Like you said, it's not the color of the skin, it's poverty, it's economic disadvantagement, it's issues with the criminal justice system around public defenders and the quality of public defenders and the behavior of prosecutors and a bunch of different things and kind of it all goes through that and, and it's important on and on, on, on it goes it, it's it's one of the things that's been eye-opening for me i i considered myself reasonably well educated i consider myself reasonably well aware before all this started obviously diversity equity and inclusion has been a huge thing for casey and i since we started this thing it's actually a big reason we started this podcast and still, I've been shocked, I've said this on a couple different shows, how in the past six weeks, really taking that effort to really even deepen my understanding, how much of this is institutionalized at every single step. And doing a slight pivot here, even within sales orgs, it starts with people, okay, I want, you know, for my SDRs or for my AEs, they have to have gone to a good school. They have to have had a certain number of years at a company. They have to have a relevant degree. Da, 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 not realizing that list in and of itself is discriminatory, not racist, yeah. because there's a difference between bias, discrimination, and racism, but it's discriminatory. You're immediately cutting out whole swaths of the population. And so, I mean, just kind of pivoting back to you, Janice, is how do you handle sales leaders who are kind of stuck in that mindset of, I want that college athlete? I want that, you know, top university. I want somebody who's got, you know, Cambridge, Oxford reading, you know, where, how do you get them out of that kind of mindset so they can get, I know one of your big passions is diversity of thought. How do you break them out of that? I have to recreate my top rep mentality. Well, diversity of thought is my bugbear. <laughs> I love that phrase. You know, I hate the diversity of thought because 
what I see is that um, if you have a diversity of, of gender, people, abilities, then because they will naturally come from different environments, have different experiences, if you have different physical abilities, your experience is going to be different. Your thinking is going to, you have diversity of thought. The problem is what I see in recruiters, in HR, uh, senior executives will talk about we have a diversity of thought. And then when you look at the board, it's all white male. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't care if you, some of them have been to Oxbridge and some to Cambridge. I really don't care. It's all white male. Yep. So the diversity of thought is going to be this much, you know, whereas if you have a variety, a diversity of people and uh, genders and abilities, you have this much difference in the thought process. And so I would like to eradicate, I would like to start a campaign to eradicate whoever created that is a distraction. And I think it's a deliberate distraction to allow companies to get away with and get away from the more difficult job of creating a truly diverse environment and culture and they're doing themselves a disservice by doing this because at the end of the day in sales we're working in a global economy digital global economy there aren't many salespeople uh, now that don't have international cu uh, customers and so you have to reflect the customers, the buyers that you're speaking to, whether within your country or outside of your, your borders. So you're doing yourself a disservice by doing that. So I'd like to eradicate. Every time I get someone on my podcast, I'm sorry, and they say diversity of thought, I'm off on one. I'm, I know I won't go on off on one you now. No, it's, but it, I'll say this, it's interesting. And I, I'm just drawing a correlation. I'm hearing a lot of, and I think it's human nature. We see this in sales all the time, especially when you're designing comp plans. Humans will always go, the, go for the easier route. It's much easier to misattribute a problem to something that looks like it's easier to solve. It is absolutely easier to profile. It just is, it's easier. It's absolutely easier just to say, we've got diversity of thought by picking you know, the, the proven and the seasoned men, white men, that have done this before, but you're in a lot of ways you're setting yourself for failure because you're not actually addressing the real problem. And it's interesting because you say diversity of thought. And I think one of the things maybe is hard is for these people who have been in control in power, who have done a lot of this stuff for the past 20 years. I think it's got to be a little bit hard to admit. I don't understand these experiences. I don't know. I think one of the hardest things to say is I don't know, especially if, like I said, you've been in power, you've been in control. It's hard to say, I don't know, I need to step back and let somebody else step up and fill this, this gap that I, as well-intentioned as I can be, as well-educated as I think I can be, I will never understand your experience, Janice. I will never understand what it's like to be a black sales I'll never understand what it's like to be LGBTQ. So as a result, I have to be constantly bringing people in with that experience to actually have diversity of thought. And it's, it's interesting, you mentioned even the international side of things. It's not even if you're selling to another country. If you're a sales rep and you're selling in the U.S., I guarantee you, you will have customers who are from another country. You still need to be able to relate to them. You need to be able to have people on your team that you can go to and say, hey, I've got this person. I'm really trying to connect with them. I know they're from the Caribbean. Is there anything I can give them or I can know about personalities or what's respectful in that culture so I can engage with them in a way that means something versus just assuming everyone can be approached the exact same way because we know that doesn't work. And if you don't have that person on your team that you can go to, you're on your own. Yeah, of course. And you know what you said about leadership, if you think about, we look at what is a good leader, mm -hmm. a good leader isn't for you. I mean, the, you think a good leader is about leading. Actually, it's not. It's bringing people forward. And so that the leader that thinks, well, I don't understand Janice's culture and what she would do and say, so I'm going to keep her back. 
actually, you know, the better leader is the one saying, I'm going to bring forward people that are better than me because, yeah. you know, and I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to get them to grow my company. I know I don't know everything. I know I don't have. So what's the best thing I can do is surround myself with people that are diverse to me, that know, know different things to me, that can help my company to grow, that can relate to my customers. That is what a good leader is. So a leader that is afraid of these things, really you're stifling the company and you're not gonna go very far. So let me ask a question, because I know there's millions and millions of millions of people who are out of work right now. How do you find that leader when you're in the interviews? What questions do you ask to identify who you're dealing with in terms of, is this a positive culture? Is this an environment that I can succeed in that will be open to my experience? How do you figure that out? Well, I think it's, well, I think there's two things. There's people that are already in the company. I certainly, any companies that I have had a connection with, I'm always asking the diversity questions. How many black people and how many women are on the board? And just by answering, asking the question is enough because if it's all white men, they don't want to answer, but actually it opens up that door that actually there's going to be more people asking me these questions. I need to start thinking about this differently. If enough people are just posing the question, then that starts to open up the conversation or the idea that we need to be doing things differently. If nobody asks the question, then it's just going to continue. If you're interviewing um, a company, you're interviewing them, not just them interviewing you. So you need to decide what culture you best fit and you need to design some questions to actually uncover if this culture is for you, because I can trust you. I have been in some cultures for whatever reason I knew at, at the interview, they weren't right for me, but I still went ahead. And I've since learned to make sure I've got my questions and even though I'm a consultant and a trainer, I ask those questions. So it's not just about recruiting for a job. It's actually, is, are they going to accept my advice? Are they going to trust me to lead them down to modernize their, 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 their sales system? You know, if not, then I'm always going to be coming up against barriers and blocks. And really, I'm of an age now where life is too short. I want to work with growth companies, with growth mindset and growth people, because, you know, I've got things that from my years of experience that I can offer that can help them to accelerate and grow quickly. So I want to make sure I'm in the right environment. So whenever I'm approached by companies, I'm interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me. And it's exactly the same when you're, you're going for a position. You've got to decide which is the type of organization you want to work with and you've got to interview them. Absolutely. And I think even taking it a step further is into interviewing the individual too, you know, asking how they, I love asking questions about how they give and receive feedback, making sure I understand if the person's going to be managing, I want to make sure they're going to, this person that I can work together and feedback is always the hardest thing to do. Is this somebody who's going to be very open and fluid with their feedback? Or is this something they're going to sit back and wait every three months for a performance review? Cause that's, not going to work with me. I need you to tell me in the moment so I can fix it. You know, knowing yourself to that extent as well. And it's and I think I think you can test it. If you get into the second interview, you know it's between, you know, a few people and you're in with the pot. Test it. Say that I went onto your website and something didn't work or, you know, you're doing kind of a bit of a critique. See how they deal with that. Do they say, oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. What would you do? Or does it get their back up? That tells you a lot about the culture. So test it. I love that. That's a really good idea. Go find her even asking a question, even like, hey, you know, I had this, but I didn't really understand it. Like, are they willing to take time to invest in explaining things? Are they telling you, oh, I don't know, just go figure it out. You know, and both are fine answers, but at least then you know what you're walking into. Yeah, exactly. which is so tricky. And I it said this too, and I, I think a lot of salespeople, once you've been around long enough, you know what happens when you ignore that little, that little knot in your stomach, that little voice in your head. Like I, I knew, I knew you were going to be trouble. I, I knew it. And I convinced myself that I could make a difference. Something I've heard a lot of people on the show talking about recently is the emotional labor that's involved with having all of these discussions. So 
I'm also wondering, what do you do for self-care to kind of make sure you keep having that fuel and that fire to keep, you know, not tilting at windmills, but I'm sure it can feel like that. You know, we are constantly having these, these tough conversations and not everyone goes the way you want it to go. What do you do to keep yourself fired up? Do you know, I remember um, Freddie Flintoff, is, he's um, a retired uh, cricketer, and he was on this uh, game show, and it was a really one of those silly game shows where they get people on um, to do various um, exercises, in the, and they fall in the water and they make a fool of themselves. And he was there with kind of younger, newer presenters, and it was an interview that they, they did, and he said, when the younger presenter said, oh, I'm not sure if we, this, is, this pilot's going to last, they were unconfident. He said, if it doesn't work, it's the producer's fault. It's the producer's fault. I always think it's producer's fault um, if they employed me and I was rubbish. It's their fault for choosing me, you know? <laughs> and I thought this is a really good attitude. Yeah. You know, when things don't work and it's not like that you're blaming people and not looking at yourself and being interested, but you just say it's a way of brushing it off. You know, it didn't work this time, next move on. Rather than going into, I'm a bad person, I'm useless, and, and all of that gets you nowhere. Actually, you're saying, well, you know, I did my best, they chose me for the job, it didn't work out, you know, next. You know, it's their fault, they obviously chose the wrong person for that job, but I'm not, I'm not the wrong person, I was just you know, not right for that moment. And you've got to find ways to just brush it off without denting your, your ego. That's not to say if you've not done a great job, you've always got to do, I've given it my best. I've done everything I can do. But then when, th you know, not everything's going to work. That's yeah. okay. It, it is, I, you, know, you learn more from the things that don't work than the things that do work, because you really look at, and understand where your place in the world is, what's unique and different about you, what you can do that no one else can do in the way you do it. And it probably wasn't that, but it is this. So you go with this. So all of this is positive feedback and you choose, you choose to make it negative feedback, but it's great to get feedback. So I yeah. think it's about the kind of attitude that you have to these things really. No, it's, that's so, so true <laughs> on a lot of different levels. And I, I, it's something I see a lot with especially entry level people. So you come in, you do your first year or two and it ends for whatever reason. And it's so easy to go to that place of, oh, well sales isn't for me. No, <laughs> and it's, it's this idea of, we as sales people tend to, we like to say, oh, our, our, we love sales because our pay is completely in our control. We control our destiny. We don't, it's a lie we tell ourselves. You are affected by the economy. You're affected by your peers. You're affected by the quota system. You're affected by what's going on in the competitive marketplace of your product. Any number of those factors can flip on a dime. And if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that that can happen to anyone at any time. And, it, and, on, and none of those are controllable by you. So when something ends for whatever reason, if you know you screwed up, own it. Great. This is what I, I, I learned. I, I can move on from there. But also at the same time, be honest with yourself about like, hey, okay, I screwed up this thing, but these other five things happened like COVID and layoffs and whatever. It doesn't mean I'm bad at my job. I can always grow. Of course, there's always going to be room to grow. But it doesn't mean sales isn't for me. It doesn't mean I'm bad at what I do. It's so easy to internalize that. And especially when you go on LinkedIn or on social media and everybody's like, look, even despite COVID, I just bought a Ferrari. And it's like, I want to punch you in the face. Nobody They're likes lying it. as well. Oh, totally. <laughs> oh, totally. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> no. I, I do. I do love those. It's like, oh, look, I just bought a Ferrari. No, you mean you just financed a Ferrari <laughs> that's going to get repoed in six months because yeah. yeah, you're trying to get more people to sign up for your random classes and out of, I don't even know. Yeah. It's, it's tough. It's, it's really tough. So kind of spinning back a little bit. I'm curious because we are really focusing right now on the side of sales around the experience of black sales pros. Do you think overall, and do you have any examples that can illustrate this, if, whether or not being black has helped or hindered you in your career? It's not helped. <laughs> 
<laughs> I feel like I have to put that answer in there. You know, option. There are so many more walls and barriers and you, uh, things that you need to go over, going to under, you know, go around and whatever. You know, I, I, I don't know that anyone can say that it's, it's a help if you're, I mean, if I, I've worked in Africa, if you're in Africa, then, you know, that's probably one of the few places where, yeah, this isn't a problem, you know. But um, if you're in America and in, in the UK, uh, it, it doesn't help. However, if I was in the America, so depending on the environment and the time and all of that, I remember when I worked in New York, I was a little more exotic. And then when I came back to the UK, I was a little bit more exotic than had I stayed here. So, you know, it's good to move around. Um, so to in order to, to measure your, your, your worth. Um, but it doesn't help. Uh, I remember when I was I was 15 and my careers advisor, uh, Mr. Clark, told me that I wasn't intelligent enough to go on to the next level to Whoa. do A-levels. A and my mother, who um, was part of the Windrush um, generation, and that's a whole nother scandal, um, wanted to be a nurse so he knew that she she wasn't why didn't you become a nurse your mother's a nurse you know or a cook like only black women can be nurses or, or cooks and it didn't really um sit right with me so i knew it wasn't right but at that stage i think i was 15 i didn't really know what was right for me you don't really say i'm going to be a, i think i said to him i'm going to be a vet which is when he said that you know i i had no idea i didn't really want to be a vet but you feel you need to say something and that's the first thing that came to my head so there's been lots of those little chipping away and the thing is you don't have the life experiences to to say oh you know freddie flintoff you know brush it off so every time you come up against something, you think, mm, maybe I should have, you know, stayed in that box, you know, you, so it takes many years to overcome those, that slow chipping away. And that's what's going on in my own head. So when I'm going up for things, so I'm already five steps behind other people that haven't had that chipping away. And no one can see that, the, the energy it takes to, you know, fire yourself up to actually go forward on, on these things. So it hasn't helped. But um, it's difficult to measure what hindrance there's been because it's just my life. I am where I am and I've done what I've done. For some people, I've done really well, you know, but I'm looking to achieve bigger greater things so i'm never satisfied really so i i don't it's i can only say it hasn't helped that's all but to what extent it may have hindered i uh, i have no idea well it's it's interesting even you bring up the death story from when you were 15 and just the idea that you would tell someone they're not intelligent tell a child they're not intelligent enough like it's one thing to say your grades aren't there or your efforts not there it's nothing just to say just blatantly you're not smart enough that that just, that would piss me off regardless, but it, it doubly- well, I do make sure I mention it quite often now. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've got a you know, Cranfield MBA from one of the top management schools I've traveled and all of that stuff. So I, I, I even went back to the school and made sure that I told um, everyone in all the, the kids in the audience, um, not to listen to your teachers. If you think you want to do something, you go out and do it. Don't let, ever let anyone tell you you cannot and you're not good enough or you're not intelligent. Enough. What the hell do they know? And I also did a, a TEDx um, talk um, that was talking about that. But also, you know, from our, our teachers, even our parents, we're given advice and they're fearful, especially our parents and the people that love us are very fearful about us taking risks. Yeah. And they will give us advice based on their experience. And it's often from people that are older. So you think that they're more experienced, but, you know, technology, um, social media, all of these things has moved on that they probably don't embrace as quickly as younger people. So you think about it. I'm taking advice from an older person that's on old technologies <laughs> about what my future will be. And that's me betting on new technology. How ridiculous is that? I mean, that is just nuts that I should take 20 year out of date advice about my plans for the next 20 years. I mean, it's just nuts. So, you know, just be careful about 
listening to advice and we were talking about the our own instincts when we go for the job and you know it's not right well actually your instincts are the best advice you can ever have it's you know all of those connections and past experience and things that you've forgotten are telling you in your body you have brain cells in your stomach and it's telling you this is not right for you or to go for it and all of that and what we tend to do especially as we get older we start suppressing all of that innate knowledge and we need to really start tapping into that a lot more that's i love the idea of brain cells in your stomach that that's a great visual but it's, i tell people all the time like that little um I've told people i've given job seekers this advice before but like when you're when you're going into interview pay attention to your shoulders that's where a lot of people carry attention if you walk into the office and you're just tensing up and you're clenching your body is sensing something that maybe your brain's not quite aware of at a conscious level yet you know your your body can absolutely sense and tell you things that sometimes your brain takes a second to catch up with because our brains are so complex and we can pick up on so many subtle things that your body will typically physicalize a little bit before sometimes your brain will especially if you're someone in my own experience i can convince myself of a lot of different things so it's really easy for me to talk myself out of that physical response but once i sort of keying into that okay i'm tensing up why am i tensing up something's what am i not paying attention to there's always something there that i have to either address and deal with or decide to walk away from and that, that that's hard to do so but I think there's one thing that I always tell people, including myself, is detach yourself from the result. Do your mm. best job, answer the questions, and almost, I really don't care what happens after that. Completely detach yourself, especially in sales. As soon as you're really kind of focusing on, I want them to sign and the sale and, you know, I want to get it done and all of that, you've got to detach yourself from the result. You go in there, you interview, you go in there and you pitch. You're doing the best job. You totally believe in your value proposition and you know it's the, the best solution for this customer. But then you've got to detach yourself. It's up to the customer the buyer to make that decision you have to detach yourself from from the result if they choose you for the job that's great all you can do is your input do the best input into that situation and then detach yourself from the results your shoulders will go down because it's almost like this is it this is me i don't care whatever you take me or you leave me if you leave me you're leaving someone that's brilliant it's up to you though you know mm -hmm. detach yourself from the result yep you know I, I think that's that's so 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 true and it's fascinating too to see how people are, are doing that and it's interesting what happens when you don't detach yourself from the result because I think for sales pros, what that ends up turning into, those are the deals that suck your time, suck your energy, and frequently end up with a pissed off customer because you're then at the point of slightly manipulating the situation into a result that really probably isn't the best thing for you or the customer instead of really trying to make sure there's that strong alignment on both sides. So it's, it's a fascinating kind of mix. Um, and it's hard to do because you've got leadership breathing down your neck saying, get the deal at all costs. Like, no, we probably don't. Uh, no, we, we, don't we don't need to discount that much. <laughs> totally yeah. true. Yeah. No, it's, it's, that's fascinating to me. So uh, let's go back. A question we, I like to ask a lot, of our, a lot of our guests is, how did you even get into sales? Like, what's kind of your sales story? Because very few people jump straight in and say, I was born to be a salesperson. This is what I've always wanted to do. Some people do, and I, God somebody, bless them. In your background, your, your dog is jumping strong. <laughs> I know. For those of you who are listening, um, my, 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 two, my, my, two, my two fur babies just got back from the groomer, and yeah. I think I forgot I left the door open, so they are running <laughs> around okay. in the background. <laughs> no, there, I've got a four-month-old puppy who is just about a half inch short from being able to jump up on the sofa and harass his brother. Yeah. So, yeah, the video for these are always great. If you're not <laughs> watching these, you totally should. But. So I, I got into sales. Um, I used to, when I was like 15, go out to um, clubs, clubbing all day as make outfits <laughs> and, um, and sell them. 
And so that was kind of my first business. And I, you know, wasn't thinking of me sell, selling, but that's what I, I did. Um, then kind of fast forward a, a bit after I did my degree, I then went to, came to America and would sell textile design. So at that time, there was no social media. This is in the late 1980s. And um, I'd go into New York City reference library, do loads of research, call people up, English accent on the phone, and would travel be between Boston and North Carolina and then come home again and wait for the money to come in and go on holiday and came back and then sort out all of the checks and things like that. So um, that was my kind of first proper sale, sales role. And it really was, you know, kind of picking up the phone, cold calling people and, and then going see, seeing them and having a, a meeting. I, um, I then um, the, kind of fast forward a, a little bit, bit further after I worked in Africa and it came back, I then worked in financial services. And this was eight o'clock on the morning on a Tuesday, uh, eight o'clock uh, stand up doing cold calling on the phone, eight o'clock in the evening, eight uh, stand up do cold calling. So that was kind of my proper formal sales training at, at that time. And so, yeah, I uh, then moved on to, I did my MBA. I worked for a construction company more in operations. I worked in customer experience. Um, and I, you know, was setting up my own uh, practice as well. So I was selling rather than doing either um, corporate B two B and sales and B two C sales. It was more kind of small, smaller consultancy um, sales and everything like that. You're nervous of those dogs, I can see. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm down your shoulders, darling. <laughs> This is the joy. This is the joys of working from home. I'm in the background. I saw yeah, my older well, dog. Everyone, everyone knows we're right. working from home. I shouldn't have drew, drew your attention to it. Don't worry about it. They're fine, darling. This is, I know. It's just. It's and this. This is how we all are. It's like, oh, I want to curate. I want to do this. It, life happens. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's fine. Exactly. <laughs> and you haven't got a baby on your lap spewing up as I'm talking. So that's fine. And no, but the big dog I think did literally just relieve himself right behind oh, okay. me on a pee pad. <laughs> no one so saw. I was, I'm sliding. No. Never like do to do, you know. Uh, although, funny story, um, I released a video on LinkedIn last week, and you could see my older dog sitting behind me on the sofa. And I had to do two takes of that video because in the first take, I didn't notice until I was doing the editing, he was having fun with his favorite toy <laughs> in the background. No idea. So I'm recording it and adding subtitles, and then all of a sudden I notice him in the background. I'm like, oh no. So I have to redo the whole video because. That's not really LinkedIn appropriate, no. <laughs> but you know, hashtag dog mom problems. So, and they're, they're good little boys. They're really, they're really sweet, but it's, it's amusing. So, you know, and you, you go through, I, I'm dying to see worked in Africa. I mean, what I, I have done very little, if any business in Africa, how is that the same? How is it different than in Europe or in the U S um, I, um, having come from, you know, I spent my summer holidays as a child in, in the Caribbean. So it wasn't so much of a, a, a massive cultural, it was looking for the similarities rather than differences. And from a commercial point of view, it's a few years behind the, the UK. So it was quite easy really. Um, and yeah, so I don't know how things have kind of like evolved and, uh, uh, but at that time it was quite easy for me to bed in when I was working there in the 1990s um, because there's lots of systems and processes that hadn't quite got there, there yet. Culturally, oh my God, it was just a, an explosion of different cultures. I mean, in Africa, there's such a mix of you know obviously african but different african countries different languages and then the his, uh, historical consequences um and you know asian as well in in, in kenya and and uganda and all of that stuff so it's a real kind of like melt melting pot as well but i think one of the differences was i remember i was working with the ministry of education in in botswana and i happened to be sitting next to the president of, of the company not the country sorry and we were having a, a, a conversation there for me to get into downing street and speak to the prime minister 
you know, there are so many levels and all of that. Whereas actually in Africa, they're somebody's cousin, you know, <laughs> they're just people that, are, you know, happen to be running a, a, a country. So it's easier to get access in, in, in Africa and have real conversations. So they're very, I feel they're very much more in touch with what's happening in the company and the kind of ground roots. It, it's fascinating just to the idea of like you're sitting and you turn to the person and it's, oh, hello, Mr. President. That's crazy. Um, I mean, it, even here in the States, it's almost this idea of, yeah, there's, there's no way the White House is happening unless it's a tour. And <laughs> even the idea of like meeting my local representative, like that's something that has, you have to work and actively seek out. They don't just show up in, you know, in, in business meetings that that's absolutely fascinating. And I think it brings up another point that it's really easy to, anytime you're, I think it's really easy to generalize any culture you're not a part of, you know, European, there's like 30 countries, <laughs> each with their very unique perspectives on things. Africa is I think something a lot of people don't realize, it's, it's hundreds, if not thousands of unique cultures. And a lot of the, you, you wanna learn about some, some interesting cultural phenomena, look at kind of how the lines were drawn in Africa and the impact that that's had on a lot of families and those cultures in and of themselves. Um, I mean, it's the one part, it's the one place in the world they're still working on the maps. The maps are still being redrawn. I mean, there's been, I think, what, there's been at least one new country founded in the past, in the past decade, and there's probably going to be some other shifts. That, that's just, it's, it, for me as a, as a student of sales and therefore a student of humanity, it's fascinating. To, but I think, don't, don't forget the differences between East Coast and West Coast. Yeah. You know, even the speed of language is different from East to West Coast as well. I mean, yeah. if you could split it in half, you, you know, it would be more than that. And then it's a different culture. So when you talk about North America, you can't really lump it all together. No. And those, you know, even you've got the coastline and then middle America, you know, that's a whole new world again, isn't it? Yeah. You know, North so versus South. In America, and, there's yeah. a whole melting pot of very different cultures as well. Yeah. It's, and again, it, it comes back to kind of this, the whole point of diversity if you've got all these melting pots, you need to be able to con connect in a meaningful way with all these different experiences. You can't do that if you have a room of people who share nothing but the, who have nothing but one common experience. And you know, the, I think the, the greatest antidote is travel. Yes. You know, tr east, west of America, outside of America, you know, you have got to travel unless you've traveled. I mean, I really wouldn't employ anybody that hasn't done some traveling around the world. And in Europe, it's a little, little bit easier because um, mo not most, I don't know what the number, but a high proportion of people are used to traveling and going across borders and, and things. But I personally wouldn't, would find it very difficult recruiting someone that hasn't tra traveled and doesn't have more aspiration to travel because I think that says something about your curiosity and your and those that are happy just to remain the same and it isn't a growth mindset i think that's a real indicator so if you're in a sales organization and you're full of people that are not travelers or have no aspiration to travel and they're getting on the phone then i think that that's another big indicator that you've probably got the wrong mix that's so true and i'll say this um i didn't travel growing up my family was not able to the moment I had my own money. First thing I did was go to Europe. Um, lifelong dream. I was able to do it luckily through a study abroad program. I was very, very lucky. But even when it comes to like within the States, yeah, you have to, I mean, it's, I think it's an incredibly low percentage of the population that even has their passport, which is just obnoxious to me. I don't understand it. But even if financially that's really hard to do, you've got family, you can't leave, you've got dogs that need to be boarded and they're expensive whatever, even if it's just as simple as seeking out experiences that are outside of what's normal for you. Um, yeah. For example, I recently discovered that there is the world's largest lemur sanctuary, like 30 miles from me. And lemurs only live on, Madag live on Madagascar. And I'm like, oh, I'm so going to this lemur center because that's just cool. 
but it's curiosity. It's that ex it's seeking those experiences out. It doesn't have to be let's drop five grand or two grand and get yes, to a exactly. different continent. It's just looking for whatever is different to expose yourself and challenge yourself with. It, it really so is you, exactly that growth mindset. When I worked in Africa, I was, I just felt really ignorant because, uh, whatever the age they read papers they listen to the world service they know the names of presidents all over the world they they have a curiosity they may have not have had the money to get on a plane to travel out but they can tell you everything about other countries what's going on right now they've got the finger on the button and that's what i mean about curiosity so it's actually about having um, an interest in what's going on outside of your own experience and as much as you can to actually try and they wanted to talk to me because they wanted to find out what's going on outside of the world and that's the difference and th those are the conversations you remember for the rest of your life those are the ones that fuel you for weeks on end and it is a magic moment when you can have that conversation with a client when you can connect the client at that level. And if you can't have those conversations in your personal life, it ain't going to happen at work either. Absolutely. So. And that's so important. How can you build empathy and, and, you know, have those conversations with a diverse client base, unless you have curiosity, unless, how can you ask those questions that are really important, not just about the kind of sales methodology, but just about the person and the environment. You have also got to be completely up to date on how businesses work yeah. and finance and all of these things. So you've got to understand the functioning of, of a business and not just your narrow vertical or your the sector that you're in you've got to have curiosity in sales because you are you're not just selling a product you're not just solving a problem you're you're creating an impact that's what you're doing in sales and in order to create the right kind of impact you've got to uh, negotiate so many different perspectives within an organization, mm -hmm. so many different characters and personalities within an organization that if you do not have curiosity, then you're not going to make it. No, it's so true. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So wrapping up this episode. They know it. Uh, they know. They, wrapping they up. know. They know it's going on. All right, so wrapping up this episode the same way we do every time with the lightning rounds. These are a series of rapid fire questions designed to be a little bit lighter. Don't think too much about them just to end on kind of, of a little more fun note. So to start with, Janice, what's your morning routine? I, I say I get up at five, but that would be a lie. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> I used to get up at five. I did it for a whole month at the beginning of lockdown. It was a real challenge. Uh, and I did it and I did it easily. And then you do one or two days, you get out the habit to get back into it. So it's near as six o'clock every morning. I get up and I meditate and then I go walking around the park because the gyms are not open at six o'clock. I used to be in the gym, but now that's my, my routine. And actually, even after the gym's open, I'm going to maintain that routine because there's a difference of getting up and rushing out to the gym and actually meditating and creating that bit of space and organizing your day and, and dealing with some of the things that have actually come up and then kind of like getting out into green and fresh air and having a more relaxed pace. Actually, I've, I've felt that I feel so much better and more positive about my, my day doing that. I, I love that. All right, pick one person who's had a significant impact on your career. That would be really hard. I, I think I would pick my parents if I can kind of put them um, as one. Um, simply because they've just you know, worked really hard. All our siblings are, stand on our own two feet and we've done better than any of our kind of teachers would have expected. And perhaps some of our, our peer group as, as well. And that's down to uh, our parents just setting the greatest examples really that's fantastic all right what's your pump up song i'm i'm hopeless with names of a thing i don't really have a pump up song i've got i'm quite energized a lot of my feedback people say oh you know i energy is the thing 
So I, you know, I'm always struggle walk on music I, to find the right walk on music. Do you know what? I get pumped up by listening to chill out music and meditating because that helps me to clear my mind and really focus. So rather than kind of like music to pump me up, I, I, you know, this is something internal that you know I use to pump me up. So so it's still kind of background chill out meditation pumps me up. I love it. All right. What's one thing you wish you'd learned earlier? Um, to think bigger, uh, to do bigger. Uh, I think because of all that little chipping away, you know, I just, I think if I, I kind of had the ability or someone told me, you know, F it and, and do it anyway kind of thing, really. Yeah. Someone almost gave me permission. I don't need that now. I give myself permission. I ask forgiveness, you know, rather than asking permission. Um, I'm, I've, I say now I've got a healthy disrespect of authority. <laughs> um, so oh, I, I think it's just thinking even, thinking bigger than I ever th think of myself because... If I do that, I say to people, I, you'd never know what the future is and what the possibilities, what possibilities are, especially now more than ever. So you've kind of just got to put it out there and think off the scale and you never know what will happen. But you've got to work at it. You can't just think it. You've got to work at it as well. That's so, so, so true. I think I know the answer to this, but what's your favorite sales book? Oh, what's what? What answer would you say then? I I fully expect you to pick up your own book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, it's so difficult because I read a I read a lot, but I read a lot more because of the podcast because I try and read the books of the guests. Um, so yeah, I uh, do you know the book that made the biggest impact in my life was seven habits of highly effective successful people yeah successful people yeah um Stephen R Covey that just blew my mind when I read it and I don't know how many years 20 30 years I don't know so long ago and yeah there's so many elements in that book sharpen your soul that I still think of now just comes to my mind um so I think that's the book that's had the biggest influence I love that. All right. What is one way someone could have been a better ally to you? Oh my gosh. Do you know when you're sitting around the conference table and you have, uh, you say something, an idea and it's ignored and then a man sitting next to you says the same idea Five and all later. of a sudden it's applauded. <laughs> yeah. I don't know any woman that has not had that experience. Yeah. And so what I would have liked out of an ally is the other men around the table to say, hang on a moment, didn't Janice just say that? Because the thing is when a woman says it, or if I say, hang on, then I look like I'm agreed. Defensive. Twisted. What we need is more men to say, hang on a moment, John, Janice just said that, she gets the credit for that kind of thing. And that's what we need is all to work together. So I would have liked more of that around the table, more men that have my back really and i you know women now are having women's backs but it we need men to be in with it in with it as well absolutely this is this is not a this is a cultural thing everyone has a role to play in these yeah. conversations in these rooms if you've got a seat at a table you have to do something with it um i, I saw a great quote on linkedin this morning uh, it was a protest sign from one of the marches in dc and it was basically i will not fight another woman for a seat at the, ta at the table i will fight alongside her to make the table bigger and i think that's a really great, great way to kind of think about that so last question what's your guilty pleasure after a bad day I'm not a, a big drinker, although I do like a bit of champagne. Never get a headache on champagne. Um, but I'd say, I'd speak, my sister's in America, I'm here in the UK, is speaking to my sister. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> As a, a, a older or younger sister? She's older. I, I have the younger sister, similar for, for me. It's, it's talking to my sister, but really it's, it's FaceTiming with my nieces. 
Yes. Yeah. You just can't be in a bad mood after that. It's too sweet. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, Janice, thank you so much for joining us. How can people find you? Uh, LinkedIn, uh, Janice B. Gordon. You put that in Google and everything comes up. Janice B. Gordon. Brilliant. We'll also put a link to that in the show notes. Um, thank you so much for being on here. It's been absolutely delightful. Let's don't be afraid to continue the conversation online, hit up Janice on LinkedIn, or feel free to comment on our bravado or LinkedIn pages. Uh, check out the show notes for links to everything that's come up today. Don't forget to follow, like, subscribe, and review on your podcast catcher of choice. And this, that's it for another episode of the other side of sales. Thank you so much.